These are real buyers that will show up. We write letters for those. We're very specific in the letters that we write. So let's say it's Nick Baldwin. I'm going to write up the letter and it's going to say, hey, Mr. Seller, I've got a husband and a wife, Nick and Ann, and they're looking for the single family residence. It's in your neighborhood. Code agents, we're back for an episode number two with Brian Grimes. So if you were paying attention, which if you're listening to this one, you probably heard the first one, and you know that we were talking about his cash, his 24-7 cash flow university and how he applies that to what he's now doing in his life. Uh, Brian, obviously, uh, I actually was was uh, wanting to ask more questions about his basketball career, the basketball career that he vacated, <laughs> uh, which, which to me was fascinating because uh, I, I think there was some possibilities there. But he, on the other hand, will say uh, he found a career that is probably much more sustainable and realistic. Uh, and, and here we are today. We talked about the Burr strategy and, and I was asking Brian, so, so he has now made a very good living for himself investing in real estate. And I said, Brian, where would you invest today in this market, which is a goofy one with high rates and low inventory? And we started to talk about investing out of state, and which led me down the path uh, of also asking him, because we talked in the last show about finding the right tenants and finding the right tenants in C markets. And, and so, Brian, let's let's kind of rehash uh, some of that and go down that rabbit hole of how to effectively invest out of state. Welcome back, my friend. Thanks. No, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, investing out of state is always I think it always kind of perks up investors ears, because when we think about investing, we all kind of tend to think about our backyard, like, oh, what I could do in my backyard, what I can do in my town. And then when things get priced out it's kind of like a doom and gloom, like, oh, man, you know, the prices are too crazy here. I just don't have the opportunities. And I kind of got, you know, thrown into out of state investing because I did my first, you know, deal and it was FHA. And I, I ended up not even moving in, I ended up getting a job out of town. So I was kind of thrust into uh, managing this property that I now had, but living uh, two states away. And in going through that process, it kind of took the fear out of it for me. It became, you know, something that I just had to build systems around. I just needed what I uh, term boots on the ground to uh, go out and, and serve as my eyes and ears. And I got away from it a little bit when I got into, um, you know, full gut renovation early on. But I realized quickly, my brother actually pointed it out to me that that was my downfall. And that I was only going to be as strong in investing out of town as my eyes and ears and my systems. So I started just focusing on um, really grassroots, bare bone systems. I believe in creating si systems that are extremely simple. The simple systems, uh, believe it or not, they're the ones that you can scale to 100 or 1,000 deals with. These extremely complex systems, they break so much that you might have success doing one or two deals at a time. But when you try to scale up to four or five or maybe 10 deals a quarter, they break in so many places, they become worthless. So um, I started to build these simple systems. And then every system after that that I added upon it was something that I would only build if, it, if I could envision it working times 100, it, even if I was only working on one deal. If it couldn't work times 100, I didn't even want to mess around with it. So uh, that was kind of the... Um, start of that journey and then I got into just specific systems. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. So it's interesting first of all how it happened for you. Did you did you say you were buying it for yourself and then ended up not moving? Yeah, I was I was doing the FHA house hack on a multifamily and I was going to move into one of the units, live for free. Uh, actually I was going to get paid like $400 a month to live in my own property. Hmm. And um in the after I closed, I was always, uh, you know, interviewing at different um, financial firms and I got 
offered an opportunity at a, a high net worth uh, boutique firm up in New York. Um, we we're managing, you know, money for, for millionaires, about 1.4 billion for 300 families. So I took that opportunity. I couldn't really pass up on it in my early twenties. And I just jetted right out of Philly, uh, straight to New York. And now I'm just managing this property, um, you know, remotely. Luckily I got it tenanted very quickly because it was in great condition. It was turnkey, but I was now an out of town investor. Um, not necessarily by, uh, choice or intent, but just by the nature of how things unfolded. It's interesting. And, and uh, so there's a couple of different pieces to this. And you just brought up the whole multifamily concept, which I, I don't feel like it's talked about as much anymore. Maybe it's just because I've grown past it. But I feel like when I was in my 20s, I always thought the same thing. Like, why wouldn't I go buy a property, live in one of the units and basically live rent free or just, you know, be able to use that money to pay down the note. Um, how much, I want to get back to this out of town thing, but I want to ask yeah. you, about it since you brought it up, you know, how many of those are you seeing nowadays and what kind of advice would you give to a young investor on doing the same thing? Cause obviously somebody, you know, who's, who's my age or thirties, forties, fifties, probably is not in a position anymore uh, to do that. But, uh, you know, what kind of advice would you give to somebody on that strategy? I mean, they're still there, right? So it depends on one. It depends on where you're at and where you're willing to uh, to live. Um, they're not everywhere, right? Like they used to be in Philly. You could get a multi at this time for 150, 130 thousand. Historically low interest rates. I mean, it, I I would literally sit there with a calculator, go on um, Redfin or just like the MLS, and I'd just be punching my calculator. Okay, this one will cash flow 800. Now I'm looking for a thousand a month. And it was it was like just, you know, light work. Now that's that's uh, difficult to come by in Philadelphia. But if you go to parts of like uh, Rochester, New York or, or some some other places, these types of opportunities still exist. Um, there is there are deals out there that are turnkey cash flow that you can just put down some money, uh, negotiate a seller's assist, maybe put down ten thousand dollars or less and control a large multifamily property live for free, uh, collect a lot of cash flow and, and build your business uh, off of that. So it does exist. It's just not everywhere. So you have to be a bit more creative. And if, if you happen to be in a location where this is, exists in your backyard, I mean, there's nothing better than that to get started. It's the safest way to get started. Um, and you'll create a lot of cash flow and getting off to a, a running start in real estate, it makes like the biggest difference because so many people get started off like bad and then they have to decide if they love this thing. Now, with that being said, on the Burr strategy side of things, there are lots of opportunities where you can go out and you can acquire a $150,000 shell that'll be worth half a million dollars when you're done renovating it and pour in maybe a couple hundred thousand into the renovation. So you're in at 350, you're pretty much in a, you know, a free property at that point. You can cash, cash out refi at a break even, maybe put a little money in your pocket if you do it with like a credit union or somebody like that who still has uh, the lower rates that are you know, available out there. And if you build this property, the reason I love the Burr today versus even the turnkey is now I can design this property. Now I can, what I call densify this property. I can add density to this, this uh, building. So I can go into it and take these large units um, and large living rooms and dining rooms, and I can dissect this property and break it up into more bedrooms because you get paid for beds. You don't get paid for baths. You don't get paid for living rooms. You don't get paid for monster kitchens. That's for flippers. If you're flipping, you get paid for that stuff. If you're buying and holding, you get paid by the bed, essentially. So you want to add density to these properties in the form of bedrooms. And when you do that, you can create more cash flow and then have this same scenario where uh, you can live in your property and have extreme you know, cash flow coming in on a you know, half a million dollar asset. Go do that you know, a couple of times, uh, maybe once a year for four years, and you're, you're a you know, multimillionaire, essentially. You, you mentioned the bed. Is that, is that specific to Section 8 or is that just in general? It's just in general, you know, from what I found, like, you know, Section 8 is kind of the it, it, it makes it very um, rudimentary in a sense where it's just like, here's the voucher. It's based on the bed. But the reality is you are creating cash flow based upon how many beds you have. If you have a five bed 
uh, property, even if those beds are, are marginally smaller, those bedrooms, mm-hmm. it's still allowing the owner to have more children and to have more flexibility. Maybe they turn a bedroom into an office space, but it's giving more livability. We have to think now, and I, I learned this from a buddy of mine who's um, just an incredible architect, comes from an incredible family uh, up in New York. They're Columbia people, so they, they bleed uh, blue like me. But um, he talked about changing the way that people use like real estate because he does commercial architecture all throughout like Manhattan. And he redesigns office spaces for today's users. Like the way that people use the office today like a a startup or a tech company is way different than people used offices 80 years ago. But most of the developers and architects are still designing uh, these these office spaces the same way. So it it became about, um, when when I talked to him about this, we started talking about redesigning residential and how are people using these properties? Are they really eating in the dining room? Do they really hang out in the living room that much? Or are people more concerned with their personal bedroom space? How large is that? How functionable is it? Do they have their own bathroom, their own privacy? So you start to get into usability. And when you get into usability, you can create a different density to that pro- property that will increase the cash flow. And um, you'll be surprised that people are very comfortable living in ways that uh, you didn't anticipate. They didn't care about that big living room. They didn't care about that dining room. So you get more money by adding more bedrooms uh, and increasing the density of the property. It's fascinating. And I wanna go back to the, uh, the shell conversation, which you talked about a little bit last, last time, but let's go back to the out of state because those who, who might be listening want, wanting to know more about that because there's, there's probably people listening and there's people out there, investors out there that say, you know, my market, there is no opportunity in my market. And there probably yeah. are many markets that are just like that. And you're saying, and you mentioned this on the last show, like there's a lot of opportunity uh, in other markets. And so, you know, you just kind of identified how you did it, but that's not going to be the case for most. Most are just going to say, listen, I've got cash. I want to invest it. I want to, I want to invest in real estate. Yeah. I live in Philadelphia and I want to invest in Indianapolis, Indiana or St. Louis, Missouri. What is my strategy for doing so? And I assume it starts with real estate agent. Um, a local real estate agent and getting contractors and all that sort of thing. But you tell me, what is that strategy? What does it look like? Yeah. So what it looks like, um, you need you need a few key components. There there are four main components. So one, uh, you the first component you should concern yourself with is eyes and ears. Um, your eyes and ears. How you can think about it? Like, do the first question you ask is, do I know anybody who lives here, where I want to invest? Um, did you go to college with anybody? high school with anybody, anybody at all. Somebody's got a cousin, um, somebody who's home might be driving Uber, maybe didn't finish college. Maybe they're not really doing much. They're not on a mission, right? They're working, they're getting by, but they don't have like something that they're super passionate about or tied to. And you want to reach out to that person. If they don't have a smartphone, get one in their hand, send them an an old iPhone, get a new one. And you're going to start to utilize them and leverage them to go out and serve as your eyes and ears. It's very important to use them even over a realtor, even over a contractor. A lot of people say, well, oh, I, I got a GC. They look at the properties for me. They're compromised. The, uh, the realtor that looks at the properties for you, they're also compromised, right? Because they have these different financial incentives outside of just what you pay them. They have financial incentives. The GC is looking at what they can make money on. Even if they're sending you videos, they're gonna send you videos that make them look good, right? They're not going to show you, oh, my guy did a hack job on the bathroom. They're going to breeze right by, they're going to walk right by it and not show you any videos of that. You need this third party, eyes and ears, who's uncompromised, who only works for you, who only marches to the beat of your drum. And you're going to use them to inspect properties, to just visually be there physically. They need to tell you uh, things that you, I mean, can't necessarily see as well. So there are things you can see in a video. And then there are things with real estate you can feel like the floor is kind of leaning like this, or this is going on here. You can't really see it. You have to train them to be able to tell you what they feel and what they see. So it's almost like you're there. And when you're in a construction uh, project as well, fast forwarding a bit, saying you went out and used them to see a property, you acquired it through the realtor, which would be the next uh, person. Um, You'd have all these relationships and then you start the construction piece. Um, 
you're going to have them doing round robins. So they're going to show up this week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, next week, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, next week, Saturday, um, Wednesday, Thursday. So you're running them in and you're creating this environment where the GC and the contractors, if you're just managing the subs as well, they have no idea when that cameraman is going to show up, but they know that person is the physical representation of you. You're behind that camera. So it creates an intensity where you can control the environment, even if you're not there. And most people do not have this person, by the way. Most people don't have this system. This guy who's your eyes and ears is probably working for beer money. $35 a visit. They're going to run in and out of house in 10, 15 minutes. But that 10, 15 minutes and that $35 a, a visit is going to save you 30K. It's going to save you 40K on the contractor running off and doing hack jobs and overspending and not showing up today and doing all these things that go on and people get burned by. So having that one simple system, that was the one system I didn't have where I, when I started off that could have saved me 40,000. And that when I started to implement, um, started to save me money and pay for themselves. And then over the course of time, you escalate this person. When you have to run the city hall to get permits, to uh, get rental licenses, to meet Section 8 inspectors or meet city inspectors who are doing certificates of occupancy, you can send this person um, instead of trying to leverage other people who aren't really there for that. Like the realtor's not there for that. So you, you have to get this person first. You'll need the realtor. And then you need, uh, outside of that, you would have you have to do research and then work backwards. I'm somebody who... I would consider me like an army man. If you drop me out of a, out of a plane with, on a, with a parachute strapped to my back and just drop me anywhere, I'm going to land there. I'm, it, it, within a month, with, give me 30 days, I'm going to go to where the contractors are. And we, we can talk about where they are and how to go to them. But I'm going to go to where they are. I'm going to build a crew. I'm going to connect with realtors. I'm going to shake hands with lenders and bankers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to hard money lenders. And I'm going to I'm going to build eyes and ears relationships within that 30 days. And then I'm out and I have a system set up that I can start pumping money into. If I have, you know, if you're sitting there with cash, you have now a system that you can start pumping money into and starting to produce deals. You might have to sift through a few contractors and sift through a few people to get your organic growth, but it will connect um, and you can do it safely with the right systems in place. So would you say the most important component to this is the finding that local person? It is. And, and, you know, there are different ways to do it. I like to do everything organically. I learned that from the startup environment, like, uh, you know, the boutique firm I worked for, it was started by two guys and they just, one was an accountant. One was like a, a former like oil company CEO and they connected and they grew their practice 100% organically. And it, it was just phenomenal. The, the, the entire business, the way they work together, I learned so much from studying these guys, like how they work, how they connected, how they grew. And I've, I've seen other startups do it the right way and the wrong way, growing organically and then forcing growth. Organic growth is the best. Getting people through referrals is the best way to start. Now, if you can't, there's nothing wrong with posting a job ad on indeed.com and doing remote uh, Zoom interviews with people and finding the right person. I've done both and I found great people both ways. But um, my, my favorite eyes and ears you know, person ever was one of my buddies that I grew up with because that trust factor, having somebody you can trust in this game, it's everything. This, is a, this can be a dirty game, you know, and, and we don't talk about, we talk about contractors running off with money but this game goes a lot deeper than just that. Like this can be a really dirty uh, game where, you know, people are trying to take advantage and cut corners. Having somebody that you can trust that you, you know, you can sit in a foxhole with is everything uh, when things go wrong. So you want to do your best to try to find that person that you can build that level of a relationship with. But I would say the reality is, and, and I want to talk to the masses here, the reality of, of saying, okay, I hear that X market is hot. I need to go there. The odds of, of everyone just having, oh, I just happen to have a frat brother. I just happen to have a high school friend who moved it. Like that's probably pretty slim. And so when you say that you maybe you put a put an ad on Indeed, and I'm, I'm focusing on this because yeah. we all know about hiring a real estate agent. That's easy, especially for this audience. 
Yeah. Uh, even hiring contractors is, is, should be relatively easy because you're probably going to have referrals from the real estate agents, right? So, yeah. Um, and and I love what you said about they have bias. They have bias based on their wallets, based on their commission, right? And so, when you say, so let's talk to the person who who uh, doesn't have contacts. So now what kind of an ad am I putting on Indeed or or am I looking for, you know, maybe a, a, a college student because you mentioned beer money. And so yeah. in that case, it's almost like I need to find somebody who is looking for something easy uh, and inexpensive, but will have my best interest in hand. It, it, Definitely. No, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, you're looking for somebody you're looking for somebody who can leverage technology first and foremost. So a lot of your contractors, the reason why you don't want to try to use them for this is. I found contractors to be like artists, like really good artists, right? Like they're, they're great uh, at what they do, but that, just because you're great at one thing doesn't make you like multifaceted and, and great at several things. Um, a lot of contractors aren't good with technology for whatever reason I've found in my experience. There are certainly going to be, you know, I have guys who are contractors who like program all of my cameras and, you know, do all the IT stuff, but they're rare. They're extremely rare. So you're going to be posting a job ad for like a, a junior entry level property inspector. You want somebody who's interested in real estate. Uh, they're going to, you know, run around, inspect properties. We'll do all the training. It's going to be like everything when you're hiring today. I want everybody understanding that you're a business. You're not an investor. You're a business. In fact, you're a startup. And the sooner you realize that and start to talk like that and market yourself as a startup. The, the quicker you will attract the right talent um, in the form of contractors, in the form of eyes and ears, in the form of realtors, lenders, everyone, uh, the sooner you will start to attract these different opportunities and people necessary to facilitate startup-like growth. And that's really what you're looking to do. So you're a startup. You're a real estate startup. We're looking for an entry-level um, property inspector. Must be good with technology. Must be good with uh, apps and and. Um, social media and you're going to get somebody younger who's really good with with tech and smartphones and who can get on and and send you these things and upload the vimeo and and do all these different uh things necessary to get you the best information the fastest and you can plug them right into today's apps and software and and hit the ball out of the park so that that's absolutely what you're trying to do I love that. And, you know, it reminded me too, when you were on the first episode where you were talking about doing these pop buys with tenants, you know, and yeah. just randomly showing up, you know, when you're vetting a tenant, if you didn't listen to the first episode with Brian, you should go check it out uh, because that was also excellent ideas on what we tend to, to overlook when it comes to tenants and where I think many of us, myself included, have failed uh, when it comes to, to, to investing and, and renting because, we vet improperly. Uh, we vet based upon the way the industry or society has told us to vet, which is credit reports, when in, in actuality, we should be vetting uh, just them as human beings. And, and that means, you know, little pop by type stuff, which is also what you're talking about right here, uh, with, with yeah. having those eyes and ears on the ground, the boots on the ground uh, to vet and hold these contractors accountable, as in somebody could show up at any moment's notice. So we better be on our best behavior. Yeah, like just showing up, that's that's where we lose, all of us, right? Whether you're out of town or in town is is less important. And and that's the, a lot of people get um, kind of scared off by out of town. They're like, wait, but I'm not there. But are you really there anyway? If you're working a nine to five, are you really there? If you're going by on Saturdays, are you really there? Yeah. I can get on a plane and get anywhere on a Saturday, anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, really. Are you really there? You're not there. You need to be there three to four days a week, round robin. You need to be boots on the ground, in somebody's face. With, with, uh, if you're not physically, then you need somebody else there physically mm -hmm. because that's, that's the type of game this is. That's what these, these uh, workers will respond to, right? That's what, that's what construction guys respond to. If you go on any commercial site, there's going to be a superintendent that shows up with a clipboard several times and people are going to be nervous that's what they're used to so when they get on your job site some of these guys are coming from the commercial space to work at your residential and when they see that nobody's here when the parents are away the yeah. kids are going to play 
Yeah. You know, it, it really is like that. So you have to have this, um, whether it's in your backyard or not, you need these systems in order to scale. Even if you can go and get to one property, can you get to 20? Yeah. Can you get to 30? Yeah. If you can't, then you better have two inspectors that can each get to 15 or three that can each get to 10. If you're going to be doing 30 deals at once, is there or you're never going to get there. Is there a certain cadence for how often? So like what you're saying is even if it's, you're doing this locally, you're probably going to need these, these inspectors. You need leverage. Right. But what's the cadence on how often you pop by and inspect? I would, you know, I, I think it changes. I mean, it's, it's based upon your team leader, whoever's managing. Like every, every construction crew has a leader, just like every basketball or football or hockey or soccer team has a captain. Why do they have captains? Because even the coach can't oversee everybody. Mm -hmm. The coach can coach X's and O's. You need somebody to coach attitude. So your team leader coaches attitude. And whoever that team leader is um, that is coaching the attitude of the team, it depends on your trust level of them. Some of these team leaders are so, you know, tough on their guys. They'll fire guys and then tell you about it. And it's like, well, I don't necessarily need to keep that close of an eye. I'll show up two, three times, round robin it and keep an eye on things. And sometimes doing that actually helps your team leader to see more because they're physically on site and they get pulled away. Um, now, if you're dealing with massive amounts of job and really tough turnaround times, like, hey, we got to hit the hard money inspection or we're going to run out of money. Like, this is serious. We might start running those guys there every day. Yeah. I, might, I might take three inspectors and say, I need you guys hitting every property every day. Figure it out. Here's, here's 50 of them. I want every property every day at worst, every other day, go. You guys meet in the morning, split it up, run it. And I want to see the videos. I want to see the checklist. Then I have a VA inspecting the videos, running through the checklist, making sure we're hitting our checkpoints. So it, it just depends on what the flow is. It depends on what the job is. If we're doing framing, I might, I might be able to do less inspections on a frame job, uh, depending on who the framing crew is. Than, than when I'm doing the, uh, when I'm doing like the finish work, because the finish work is coming faster. The paint's up in, in like a day. The frame is going to take a week. We'll go there, you know, once and then another time in three days. Nothing's going to happen really in between. That paint's going up in a day. The flooring's going down in a day. Uh, the trim's going up in a day. We might have to be a little bit faster during that, that uh, time frame. So it, it depends on, on several things. But either way, I would say at a minimum, you want to be getting there three times a week three times a week per property and round robin they because because they're going to figure you out like you have to yeah. this is this is more of a checkers game than chess mm -hmm. so you don't have to be too fancy but if you keep going uh like monday clock. wednesday friday yeah. then on tuesday and thursday guys ain't showing up they're showing up late um you know things are going to start happening so you have to you have your job is to put out fires all day and keep everybody on their toes you're 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 controlling the environment you're creating the environment. It doesn't have to be a hectic environment, but it has to be a tight ship. We run a real tight ship here. If you don't like it, go to the other guy. He doesn't care. He doesn't show up. And you can burn him and rip him, but you can't rip me. That has to be the attitude and the environment, or you're going to attract the people who want to play. And you're going to get the result of, of you know, the players at, at the how, end of the day. How much are you paying these guys that are going three times a week? That, that's um, going to cut into your cash flow. It's going to cut into your profits. I mean, well... Yeah, that's what you think, right? Until you get burned for $30,000 by not doing it. So these guys don't cost you $30,000 a deal. You know, they might cost you, like I said, $35 per visit. They could cost you $50 per visit. That's $150 a week for three, three times a week. That's $600 a month. If you run the average project in 12 weeks, full gut, that's $1,800. Or, and that'll save you probably $18,000. And efficiency, because you got to remember, I'm speeding up the entire environment. The entire environment is faster now. They know I'm looking. They're producing at a faster speed. It's kind of like uh, if I take a, a basketball team from a half court offense, Chris Paul's running it, and I take them to like Lonzo Ball's running it, and we're just running and gunning. I'm speeding up the game. And when I speed up the game in construction and I run it efficiently through inspections, I'm getting the job done faster and I'm turning. To, it, it's called uh, the concept is I, I watch a lot of like Chef Ramsey and some of these like uh, famous chefs. They, how do chefs make money? 
well, there's several ways. One, you can charge more per plate. Um, two, you can turn more tables faster. Or three, you can do both, right? So turning tables means if, if you come into my restaurant, we both have a restaurant. People go into your restaurant and your average patron stays for three hours. So you're running a dinner service. You can run that dinner maybe uh, twice. So you're getting them in 6 p.m. to midnight. You're running two tables. You're only flipping two. So you're getting paid twice. I'm flipping tables. I get the average patron in and the food's coming out faster. They're in and out in a half hour. I'm flipping the tables four times in the same night. I'm getting paid four times. You're getting paid twice. I'm making more money than you. You know, so it's it, it becomes like flipping tables. How can I control the speed? And is that worth eighteen hundred dollars? You bet. You bet. Because I've done this over the course of hundreds of deals and I've seen it And the uh, th this is the uh, they'll say like a, a penny wise pound foolish type of uh, illusion or um, paradox. Right. So you think you're being penny wise uh, by not taking on these expenses but it becomes pound foolish because you can't see the losses people. And I, I've learned this about real estate. We can't see, we can't see the real money. We, we really can't. We think, Oh, the money is here. The money's on the flip. The money's on the cash out. No. When, when you get a warehouse, I, you know, I, I was arguing about this with my partner at a time. Oh, we need to get a warehouse. Oh no, it's too much money. And this, the, how much did the warehouse cost us? I got a half million dollar warehouse. It cost me three grand a month, three grand a month. I start running all my materials through the warehouse. Everybody's giving me 40% discounts because I can order in bulk. I can order a hundred uh, shower diverters at once. The warehouse saves $200,000 a month. Wow. The warehouse starts saving $200,000 a month of ghost money. It was just being spent. And now it's not being spent. And there are re there's money out there in the form of efficiency that you need to be able to see because once you can get your hands on it, you can now scale up. Same thing like getting a dump truck. You go buy your own dump truck or you're gonna order the dumpsters. The, you order the dumpsters is $600 a dumpster. I order the dump truck, I buy it, I finance 100% of it. I write it 100% off in year one with bonus depreciation. It's $600 a month on the note and I'm, and I'm running dump trips. Now I'm only paying for gas and the cost of the dump. I'm saving six to $10,000 a month by buying a dump truck and getting a $50,000 write-off in year one for the entire purchase of it. I mean, you, got, you just have to, you got to follow the numbers. You really have to dig into the weeds of the money, but there are savings in these systems. And that's why I leverage them and use them. If there weren't savings in them, I wouldn't do it. It's a it's it's fascinating. I mean, your mindset is clearly unique. Uh, I think from most investors, and I think this is why they need to hear it. And and before we wrap up, uh, I, I do want you to talk more about you know what you do with twenty four seven cash flow university. But before we get there, um, I, I want to now talk real quickly about okay, now how do you find the properties? So you know it's it's interesting because we've really focused on the processes, which is really you, you know it's your mo, uh, but focusing on on you know, what a lot of investors don't think about, which is having those boots on the ground. And, yeah. and so, but now, okay, so I have the boots, but what's the best way to find the best market and find the properties at that point without having to rely on somebody who's got a biased interest on their commission? What's the best way to find the properties to, yeah. Uh, yeah. to do the deals? Um, well, I mean, you can use a realtor, but you need to, to me, a realtor just opens the doors. Not to, like, I don't want to, like, knock on what realtors do, but I'm talking about for me and the level that I play at. If I'm leveraging a, a realtor relationship, it's so they can open a door and get me into the property. I'm doing all the analysis. I'm sending my guy in with the video with them um, to inspect the property. They're there as a, as a team member to add leverage. It's not only to open doors. I won't, I won't just say that. It's also to handle the contracts. So if they, you know, they can negotiate the contracts, a realtor adds leverage. You want to you, uh, view a realtor as somebody who adds leverage to you. They can deal with some of the paperwork. They can go back and forth with the seller. But a lot of realtors, I found, they don't want to make the decision. If you try to press them, like, what should I offer? They're like, you figure it out. I don't want that liability. But they're there to just kind of push 
the system. I mean, there are there are things that you'll run into like. I have like five bulletproof clauses that I put in every contract that I developed that I force my realtor to do. Sometimes I argue with realtors. They don't want to put my clauses in the contracts, but I'm, you know, I make them do it because I've run into issues with different deals over the course of hundred deals, but I'm, I'm doing all my own market research. I'm going on MLS. I'm going to the auctions. I'm sending my boots on the ground um, to the auctions at times. I'm sending my people there to go out and figure it out and, and bid on properties. You know, I'm doing all of that work myself. I'm, I'm, if there's anything that I'm really good at, it's deal analysis, finding good deals uh, that are going to be profitable to build. So I usually take that on, on my shoulders and that's more of a, a research-based uh, process of going in, uh, pulling out the calculator, finding the cash flow, running the numbers, making sure it's a good deal. And I might look at 100 deals on the MLS for every 10 that I go to see. And for every 10 that I go to see, I'm probably putting out three offers. So in order to lock up 30 deals, um, you know, a month, which I've done more than that, I think my biggest month, I'll put 40, 40 or 42 deals under contract, which is more than one a day. Um, you got to see a lot of, you got to kiss a lot of frogs <laughs> is, is uh, what they say. You got to kiss a lot of frogs. So, how are you, so if, if you're, if you're having the ability to do that and you're doing that, how are you finding these properties? Like, like how labor intensive is that? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't call it labor intensive for me. It's leverage intensive. So you need you need to train. Uh, you need to replicate yourself. So if you know how to do the analysis and go out and, and inspect properties and, and find good deals, you need to now um, in increase increase your leverage. So you need to train some virtual assistants to learn how to look at those videos and make analysis based on those videos and run comps and create deal reports. And things so that you can sit at the helm of your ship and put out all, and just decide, yes, put out the offer there. Don't go, go, don't go. So but, it, how, are these, uh, but how are these deals? You're kind of getting yeah. ahead of the question. Yeah. How are you even finding the deal in the first place to even put it to the VA? I'm, I'm essentially creating up a, a series of deal screens. So I have, I have wholesale networks. I have the MLS and I can create a series of deal screens so that anytime a deal hits the market with this type of metric, it, it floods into my inbox. And then I have I, either me personally or VAs that will pull those deals out and put them into a funnel. And once they go into that funnel, this becomes a, a ideal deal. So, so let's break it down um, for, for like, you know, somebody who would just be getting started. Yeah. If I'm doing a deal, if I'm looking at a deal, right, or if I've done like 50 deals, I know after a point in time of doing the construction on these deals, what it costs to full gut renovate these properties. They're all kind of the same, especially based on square footage. So I know what it costs to renovate a 1200 square foot row home, pretty much in any major city in, in, in the country. So I will look at that deal and say, okay, well, if I can buy it for 50,000 or less, and it has an ARV of 250,000 or more, I can make money off of that. So now any deal that falls on the market that's, 65, that's listed as $65,000 or less that has this certain square footage or more, I'm gonna, it's going into my funnel. I wanna see it. Now, if I go and see it and it passes my eyes and ears inspection from a structural standpoint, from a first round standpoint, I'm gonna, off, I'm gonna bid on it because I know if I win it, I'm gonna make money. And you need to just have your system be that simple. It has to be big picture simple, which is if we can get it for this cost, if we can buy low because the money's made on the purchase, not on the sale or not on the refi, on the purchase, then I know I'm making money on the purchase. So I'm just locking up assets that are within my developer spread. So I'm building a pipeline of deals that are within that developer spread of $200,000, buy it for 50 or less. Um, it's going to be worth 250. I can build it at 100. So I'm in at 150, it's worth 250. I do a cash out refinance at 200. After all the friction, Maybe I keep like $25,000, $30,000 per deal. I'm getting paid to build. And if I can go out and do 100 of those a year times $20,000, I'm going to make a good amount of money. And that's as simple as it needs to be. And then you need to run out and focus on execution, getting more deals that fit that into your funnel and then running your eyes and ears through them, then running your realtor through them on offers, getting them locked up, send them to the title company, get them closed, get the contractors in them, run your eyes and ears on the contractors, get them full gut renovated in 12 weeks turn them, get them tenanted, watch rinse, repeat, get them refined. You know, you should start running. 
your, your funnel. So it's really all about setting up deal screens that fit there. If they're listed at 65 or less, I know I can lowball offer and negotiate them down into my profit range. Uh, or if they're in better condition than expected, maybe I'll buy it for 65 because it doesn't need much work. I also have wholesalers that are sending me deals every day. I also am going to the auctions and the auctions are auctioning off properties for 20,000, 30,000. And I can add those into my, my uh, flow. So I'm really looking at any deal that is listed anywhere on market, uh, if it's off market through wholesalers and I'm trying to get my hands on them if they, if they meet my developer spread criteria. Are you doing this, when you say you're going to auctions, obviously you're only capable of doing that locally, or who are you sending out of, out of state or out of city? Eyes and ears. Eyes so and ears. Those same people. Those same people. I'm making the, I'm building them up. They're, first they're starting uh, in one area and then they're, they're getting built up into another. How many doors or how many rentals do you uh, currently own? Um, uh, doors would be, doors would be over 300, but it's, it's right around 300 um, in terms of individual properties. There is, so, there is so much that we could continue to talk about here. Um, and that's why I wanted to have you back for a second episode. But I tell you what, instead of, instead of having a third episode, I think there's, there's something that, that, that our listeners need to do. And that is, if they want more from you, uh, they need to go find you uh, with the 24-7 Cashflow University. So let's talk about that, because obviously there's a lot of stuff that we touched on. We maybe, we maybe didn't answer every question that somebody might be thinking about. Um, and so if they want to learn more and they want to learn about some of these strategies, which, which, you know, you don't hear talked about every day. And this is probably why Brian, that probably is why Brian is so successful at this, you know, tell us about that university. What does that entail? And if somebody wanted to get involved and, 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 and learn directly from you. Yeah. So, um, and I appreciate that setup. So the, you know, the 24 seven flow university is for somebody who's like an absolute beginner, right? It's, it, if you're advanced and you've already done 15, 20 deals, you're going to get a ton of value out of this because you're going to be able to take all of my systems and just run and, and get up to like 50 to 100 deals a year and do whatever you want in real estate. But even if you're a beginner, I break down the entire journey, the mindset you need, um, all of the knowledge you need, all of the systems that you're, you're just going from zero, zero deal zero to, you know, deal 10. What does that look like? How do you build these relationships? How do you learn how to full gut renovate properties? What are the steps there? It's all broken down uh, on teachable.com. I put together a, a massive course. We do mastermind calls uh, every Monday night at 8 30 PM Eastern standard time. So we're doing one, you know, tonight, today's Monday. So we're doing one tonight. And, um, you know, we break down a variety of different topics, like how to put your properties in a trust, and, and what does that do for you? So we just break down advanced topics, uh, kind of nonstop, and those get uploaded into the course. You get access to me. It's more of a, I call it more of a mentorship program than a course, because I like to spend time. I don't take on everybody. I uh, work closely with my, my VIP people in like a one-on-one -on -one type of fashion. I, I call it like a, a mother goose strategy, which is I, I hold your hand, I walk you through the park, and so you push me away and say, I don't need you. And then I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm a, I'm a text away. I'm an email away. Um, but, you know, if you want to tap into that, you can you can find me. You know, you can find me on YouTube. Uh, Brian loves cash flow. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Brian Grimes underscore two, four, seven cash flow um, university. You can you can find me uh, also on LinkedIn, Brian Grimes. Um, just type in like Brian Grimes real estate. You'll, you'll find me. Um, you can also find me directly. I put together some free trainings for you guys uh, at www.workwithgrimes.com forward slash cash flow, workwithgrimes.com forward slash cash flow. So I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. We also have a program that is uh, it's, it's newer, but it's having a lot of success, right? It's called my boots, <laughs> my boots on the ground program, right? Um, because that's my my big system that I wanted to tap people into. People came to me at some point, some of my VIP students and said, Brian, how can we get faster at this? How can we just like become you? How can we become you like overnight? And I said, well, that's a great question. Let me go in the back cave and think about this. So I thought about what is me? Who, you know, who am I and, and how could I make somebody me in like, like overnight? So I came up with this program, right? And all of the things we talked about, like how to find deals, how to source these things, how to just be that person that sits at the helm and says, yes, put this offer out. Don't put this one out. That's what the boots on the ground system is. I tap you into my realtors, my deal flow, 
my wholesalers, my lenders that'll give you 100% of the cash uh, to acquire and rehab the properties, um, my contractors who I've done hundreds of deals with, all my boots on the ground people, my inspectors, and we show you how to get the deal flow pumping in. You take your deals that you want to go see, you, you punch them into the funnel. My inspectors run them. Um, we, put out, we help you to put out the offers. We put together a detailed analysis report for you that breaks down the cash flow, the cash out refinance, the cost of all the um, construction. We do a full budget workout for you, uh, how much the hard money is going to cost, how much the friction is, everything down to the T uh, with discounts, with property management discounts and everything. Um, and we show you if this is a good deal all the cash going in, all the cash coming out. And this is profitable. Can you cash out refi? Can you get paid to build? And then we will put the contractors in place to full gut renovate the property for you, help you to tenant it, help you to put property management on at the back end and wash, rinse, repeat this thing. And you can tap directly into that. Um, it also gets you access to my masterclass and all the one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So that's been highly successful. We have people outside of the country who are tapping into US real estate. Right now, this program, I have it in Philly, sixth largest city in America. Uh, so if you wanna grab some of that Philly cash flow, come and get it. And um, we're opening it up to a few more cities um, pretty soon so that you can tap in remotely. So this allows you to sit around in your PJs, eat some cereal with your family, be on vacation and be flipping the house, getting videos every day uh, of your property or buying and holding, doing the birth strategy with it, whatever you wanna do. It allows you to be me. Um, at the, at the, you know, snap of a finger. So it, that's something that, you know, if you're interested in, definitely reach out. I don't take on everybody. I keep that group super small so that I can spend uh, as much time as possible. But for the few that are in it, um, that are even, you know, in Canada, Ontario, and outside of the country, and the people all over the country who are in it, uh, we're having a lot of success with it. That is uh, a mouthful, and there's a lot of options you have there. All of this will be listed in the show notes. Uh, Brian, I just went and followed you on Instagram. I'm not sure why I didn't do this after the first show, uh, but I did here nonetheless. I wanted to ask <laughs> you know, one last question. You said to be like you. you know, I'm 5'10". I'd like to be 6'7". <laughs> um, can, you, can you help me do that too? Is that, is that possible? I think there's some new science coming around <laughs> like that. Like they break your knees and insert something and, and stretch you out a bit, but uh, nah, we're, this is- we're gonna uh, chop some of your <laughs> Like off and give it to me <laughs> yeah tran a height transplant um and i'd love to share the wealth i'm not uh, unfortunately i'm not doing much with the with the six seven right now uh you know as much as i was in my younger days but no nah, um nah, i gotta imagine funny. your presence walking into a real estate auction is a little bit more powerful than my presence walking in i don't know if that matters or not, but, you know. no, no definitely <laughs> I love it, brother, man. This has been great. It's been fun talking to you. There's just so, so, so much here. Um, I've even got some, some buddies that uh, I might even, I might reach out to on a personal level and, and try to get them tapped in. Um, I appreciate everything. And I hope, I hope our audience gained as much from this. I mean, like I said, I could continue to ask you so many questions, but you know, there's only so much time in a day. And I know you've got to go, uh, you got to go burn, burn, turn and burn some more properties. So uh, I appreciate it, brother. I hope we stay in touch and uh, thank Definitely. you. For, thank you for sharing with our audience. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. And uh, definitely we'll stay in touch and um, stay connected over the years for sure. Definitely. All right. Black Coat Agents Podcast.